The sudden shock of this change in speed is called a crash pulse. The energy released during a crash pulse can rip metal apart and cripple and kill people. The longer the pulse lasts, the worse the damage is to men and machines. But even an extremely brief pulse, like this one, can do enormous harm. In a full-scale train wreck at 36 miles per hour, the devastating effects of a sudden impact are even more traumatic. Testing relies upon the silent heroics of crash test dummies. They let researchers put bodies into dangerous environments without killing anyone. They have weathered everything from air disasters to car wrecks. Before there were crash test dummies, real human beings put their lives on the line for science. For nearly a century, researchers have tried to understand what happens at the moment of impact and how people can be protected from injury. Testing was born in the carnage of World War I. Military dollars had turned airplanes from gimmicks into mass-produced weapons of destruction. The first fighter planes often crashed or were shot down, killing their pilots. But sometimes men died in seemingly minor accidents, while others walked away from crashes that looked fatal. Hugh DeHaven was one such pilot, a training accident left three men dead in Haven badly injured. While he recovered, he pondered the mystery of why he survived. DeHaven became an accident investigator dedicating his life to understanding what hurts and kills people in crashes. In the years leading up to World War II, the U.S. Navy asked DeHaven to make their carrier-based aircraft safe for pilots. DeHaven recommended keeping pilots tightly strapped in their seats, which would restrict their movements during a crash. He also advocated the use of crumple zones, parts of the airplane designed to collapse on impact. The crunching of metal in the crumple zone absorbs most of the energy released in a flight deck accident. These fighters were the first crash-worthy aircraft. The Haven took the idea from the shipping industry, uh, the idea being if you want to, for example, ship a, a set of fine china from one place to another, how could you package it to keep it intact and get it to the other end in original condition? And he applied the same set of ideas to keeping people intact inside a container. You have to keep the container relatively intact uh, you can't let it crush in on the occupants. You can't let it open up and spill them out. You gotta hold them immobile inside the container as much as possible. If you think about a piece of china inside a box, if you allow it to move around very much, which it might do in shipment, as soon as it starts bashing into the sides of the box, it's gonna break. People do the same thing in a crash. Crashworthiness soon found its way into warplanes across the world. But when Nazi engineers built the first jet-powered planes, they faced new problems of survivability. Their jets could fly twice as fast as propeller-driven aircraft, but with increased speed came increased risk. Few pilots wanted to bail out of a plane falling at hundreds of miles per hour. 
So engineers came up with the idea of the ejection seat. The war ended before they learned how to shoot a pilot out of a crashing jet without crushing his spine. The U.S. Air Force took over where the Luftwaffe left off. These ejection seat tests were part of the effort to find out if the human body could tolerate the extreme accelerations and sudden stops pilots would face during ejections and crash landings. Colonel John Stapp, a research physician, led the Air Force medical testing program. From 1947 to 1970, Stapp put himself and a team of volunteers through a brutal series of impact tests. He was trying to determine how much G-force humans can withstand. One G is the force of gravity that holds us down to the Earth. The Air Force guessed that anything over 16 Gs would be fatal. Stapp contended that pilots could withstand far greater G-forces if their exposure time was limited to a fraction of a second. Safety harnesses were the key. Stapp put his theories to the ultimate test in a series of high-speed trials using a rocket-powered sled and himself as a guinea pig. He probed the boundaries of human durability. In just five months, he took 16 rides. He survived brief exposures of up to 35 Gs, twice the predicted limit. A tenth of a second at 35 Gs feels like dropping 10 feet and landing on your face. There are actually three collisions in every car crash. The first collision happens when your car hits an object. The second collision occurs when your body hits something inside your car. The third collision takes place when your internal organs collide in your bones. Stapp and DeHaven proved that safety devices can help drivers survive all three levels of collision. Thanks to their pioneering research, the concepts of crashworthiness were introduced into cars around the world. Lap belts and shoulder straps, devices that slow the rate of the body's deceleration during a crash became standard equipment. Airbags were introduced in the 1960s. Deploying at the speed of sound, they cushioned drivers from harm. By the 1970s, the rigid frames of cars were redesigned to incorporate the crumple zones that De Haven had long championed. Now a common feature of automobile design, crumple zones absorb the energy of an impact by letting the car collapse around the driver, who is kept safe inside a reinforced cockpit. All of these devices were first tested on crash test dummies. But dummies have their limitations. They are, after all, made of plastic and metal, not flesh and bone. They don't have human reflexes. They don't bleed. And they can't explain what they experienced at the time of an accident. Sometimes you need a real man to put his body on the line. That's when researchers call in Rusty Haight, the human crash test dummy. Since 1990, this former policeman has survived more than 550 car crashes. I started teaching with the Texas Engineering Extension Service in 90, and as a function of those classes, we ended up doing crash testing, and it fell to someone, me, to do the driving. The first few were fairly low-speed, benign crashes. Hey, get his license! More recently, they can be, they can be pretty brutal. 